Mini PCs, and by extension notebooks and laptops, are not seen as something you can upgrade the hardware for. A conventional computer like this one is much more easy to upgrade and repair, as the whole unit works in a very modular fashion. If something breaks, we can simply switch it out. In today's video, we'll show you how to upgrade your hardware in your mini PC. What is possible? Let's find out. Welcome to Team Pandora. Subscribble. Before we do any modifications to our system, it's a good idea to log into your Microsoft account. This is essentially a safeguard, so if you modify our system in any way, we can keep Windows activated. If later you come into an issue of it not being active, you can come to this screen, click the troubleshoot option, and then I changed hardware on this device recently. Always use protection. Now that's out of the way, let's get into the meat and potatoes. We'll first look at upgrading storage. This little SSD was sent to us from Afro. It's their P10, an external SSD that's the size of a hockey puck. These were intended for our iPhones with MagSafe technology, but it should be compatible with many devices going at speeds of 2000 megabits a second. Comes with two small USB-C cables, and it seems that MagSafe is not compatible with my Android phone. It's not sticking at all. Saying that, it does work as a storage device, but if your mini PC has no USB-C socket, you'll need to find another cable. So just pop it in like this, and you're ready to go. If you primarily use Windows, we recommend to format to NTFS, as this is much less prone to data corruption. So let's use it for our games. In our Steam settings, go to Storage, click up here, and then Add Drive. Now we can easily install Steam games to our external SSD. And using this menu, we can move away games from our system drive, which can aid the stability on your Windows computer. For when using any external SSD, make sure you use the best ports and cables you can get your hands on. Here it is, hooked up to a USB-C port, a USB-A to USB-C cable, and then a random cable I picked up from the floor. The difference is night and day. Let's move on to the internal storage. And to get inside here, we'll need to use a small screwdriver. Be sure not to lose these rubber feet, and remember which way around they go. It's, uh, um, oops. If there isn't a tag available, we can use some tape to pull it open. The SSD is usually quite easy to access, and it may have a heatsink. To remove, unscrew with a small posi driver, and then pull it out at an angle. So this is the 512GB SSD, and 2242 tells us its dimensions. It's 22mm wide, 42 long. From the pins we can see it's an M2 SATA drive, which are typically slower than a PCIe NVMe, and if we check the main board, it should tell us if they're compatible. So this one supports a PCI Express or a SATA SSD, but for more information, we'll have to check the manufacturer's website. So I'll first find the spec sheet, and it states it doesn't support PCIe Gen 3 or 4, but as a standard is backwards compatible, even if you inserted a faster NVMe stick, speeds will be limited to that of the slot itself. But what if you have an NVMe that's too short? Well, this one here I used previously in the Steam Deck, and the dimensions are 2230, meaning it's 12 millimeters short. What we can do is get one of these spacers. They're very cheap on Amazon, and it fills the blank space up, allowing us to fit a shorter SSD into the slot. So we need to extend 30 to 42. Obviously, we don't use the full thing, as that'll give us a huge one. A nice handful. So all we need to do is break the piece off that we need. So this bit here. Then the spacer goes into the mini PC, insert storage at an angle, once in push down, and give it a screw. Ghetto. But it'll look much better if you get one with the same dimensions. This king spec, PCI 3 before, fits like a glove. As the system only has one slot for storage, you need to reinstall an OS. It sounds a bit overwhelming at first, but don't worry, all you'll need is a USB stick handy, and if you want to install Windows 11, visit the Microsoft website and follow instructions. Once this process is completed, we simply need to boot the computer with the USB inserted, and Windows will install. Alternatively, if you don't want Microsoft near your PC, we can use a Linux distro like Manjaro, or the extremely popular Bazite, which is basically SteamOS for your mini PC. But if your mini PC has space for additional storage like this one here, all we need to do is add a compatible stick. The SATA M2 should be okay for storage, but for better speeds, the PCIe 3 before is the better of the two. I have a large stick. I'm sure you do. 
be careful when you do this and don't force anything. Usually storage is fine without a heatsink, but in this case, a fan's gonna blow cool air onto it anyway, so it should be good to go. As for which brand to choose, any of the main ones should be fine. And if you bought it from Amazon and have an issue, easy returns. But what about AliExpress? Well, you can find some good prices here, but usually they'll be weak source versions. And if the deal is too good to be true, it probably is. For example, this one here, do not touch. It'll be fake spaced and everything will corrupt before you know it. But if you do need something from AliExpress, we found that these brands are a bit of all right. Alongside the CPU and storage, memory is one of the most important components of a home computer. As it's regarded as ultra-fast storage, having more available can keep your computer running smoothly and even speed up games. So if that's your main focus, more is definitely better. As for which memory to choose from, it's heavily dictated by the computer itself. But if you ever get a choice between DDR4 and DDR5, go for the latter, as in most cases, it's much quicker. There are some mini PCs where the memory cannot easily be upgraded. For example, the GMK Tech G5 and the Chewy Larbox X 2023 both have 12 gigabytes of DDR5 soldered directly onto the motherboard. But there are also mini PCs where you can change the sticks. This computer only has one slot populated with eight gigabytes of PC4 memory. This is also known as DDR4 laptop memory. We can easily find a cheap 16 gigabyte stick on Amazon and replacing it will quickly double the size. If you're unsure of the type of memory you need, check the mini PC specs online, or you can check the numbers found on your old memory stick. When it comes to newer Ryzen mini PCs, system memory is shared with the Radeon GPU, and slow memory will mean slow FPS. If you have two slots available like this, you can get huge gains by filling both slots with identical memory. This will effectively double the speed and is known as dual channel mode. And the difference, night and day. You can get match sets like this online, but remember that unreliable memory can lead to an unstable machine, so stick to well-known brands like Crucial, Team Group, or SP. While having fast memory is important, keeping it cool is crucial, as when the memory gets too hot, it can thermal throttle. What this means is it'll slow down in order to protect itself from getting damaged. In regular use, you won't really see this, but if your mini PC has little airflow, it's much more common especially when gaming. Now there are graphene heatsinks, but we found that these are nothing but a bucket full of empty promises. What we need is something more substantial and good airflow. A great example can be found in the Riotan Alloy 9. A fan blows air directly into the memory, and there's a special heatsink that keeps the bottom chip cool. We're not seeing these for sale online yet, but if you can find these, they're pretty nifty. You can also attach a heatsink to your NVMe. If you have decent airflow and enough space around it to breathe, they're generally not needed, but they are fairly cheap, and keeping the temperatures down will allow it to last longer. But if you have a mini PC like this B-Link Sir 6, then you won't have to get anything extra, as there's a massive heatsink already in the case design. The CPU of a mini PC or laptop cannot be upgraded as easily as a full-size PC. But there are some things we can change. For example, we noticed instances of thermal throttling and a very noisy fan. Usually this happens to computers and consoles after a few years, where components overheat and the computer's performance is severely limited. Thankfully, one solution for this is to replace the old thermal paste with new. There are charts online if you want to compare performance, but we recommend using either Arctic MX6 or Amec SGT4, as these are cheap, work well, and most importantly, do not conduct electricity. They usually come with an applying tool, and the procedure is much easier than it sounds. Let's get in there. With the bottom shield off, we can see more components, but still no CPU. To get in further, we'll need to unplug these Wi-Fi cables. Just get a fingernail under the connector and pry it up. Remove the Wi-Fi module. Whoops. Carefully unplug any of the connectors. And now we should be able to pull it out. There we go. So this here is the heatsink and fan, and its job is to pull up heat from the CPU and blow it away from the mini PC. So after disconnecting and removing the screws, we can pull it off. And if this is dusty, you can give it a clean. So the area we need to get to is underneath this heat spreader. Just remove these four screws. 
Magnetized tip is very handy. While removing, I like to wiggle it left and right. This helps prevent damage for the off chance that the thermal paste has hardened up. Either way, we're going to be replacing this goop, but first we need to give it a clean. I like to start with the alcohol wipes from the dollar store, first with the heatsink, and then the CPU, with the goal of removing as much paste as possible. As this CPU in particular doesn't have many visible components, we can do a good job only using wipes and a cotton bud. And now to apply the thermal paste. The first squeeze is usually onto a tissue, so we're certainly using fresh paste on the CPU. As it's non-conductive, we can be a bit messy with it. I like to finish it up with a fresh cotton bud. Use it like a paintbrush, so the whole chip is more or less covered. To put it back together, we simply reverse our steps, including the little wiggle. Here's how it was at idle. And with the new thermal paste, it barely goes above 50. And it's whisper quiet. Under load, we were hitting 95 degrees Celsius on the CPU, and it was pretty loud. With the new thermal paste, we're 20 degrees lower, and again, the difference is night and day. So how about we try with this one? We've not yet pulled one of these apart to the point we could see the CPU. And the last time I asked a representative, he said it was possible, but you needed to bend the plastic. So let's give it a go. I'm gonna try pulling out the back ports first. And eventually, oh. Yeah, baby. And from here, the process is pretty much identical. The fan is also taped to the heatsink, and by folding over and turning like this, it can be removed with little effort. The heatsink is still attached to the board, so we need to get to these two screws in here. Just pull this back a bit. It can remove all the screws that are holding this down. The condition of the paste doesn't look too bad, but not enough sits on the chip itself. We'll again use the alcohol wipes but this time we need to be a bit more careful, as it contains more tiny components that surround the main chip. If it looks like you're in for a hard time, I find that electronic cleaner can help tremendously. It basically breaks down the paste and it can be wiped off later. Now for the new stuff. There is definitely a difference between new computers and one that's actively being used. For example, my daughter's PC has dust in the heatsink, which you can remove with a toothbrush or canned air, and the thermal paste was visibly worse. But as the paste had hardened up, it easily flakes off, making the cleaning process very therapeutic. To further cool and quieten down the system, some creative geniuses have managed to design custom cases that you can print out yourself. They usually focus on increasing airflow, allowing a larger fan, and are usually free to download. But remember, there's nothing stopping you from designing your own. Some people may steer away from certain mini PCs due to the choice of Wi-Fi chipset that is used, but you may not realize that you can actually upgrade this very easily. And for around $15, we can get Wi-Fi 6. But rather than purchase blindly, we should check to what we already have. In this case, two detachable wires for Arial and a Wi-Fi module from CD Tech. It has RTL on the label, which tells us the Realtek chip, and I usually compare the shape of the pins to see if it can fit our unit. For example, here's an Intel AX200 Wi-Fi 6 module, and the silhouette of these two models will be identical. Similar to installing the storage, we put it in an angle, push down, and give it a screw. The most difficult part of the process is connecting the antenna. We found the easiest way to do this was to latch onto the edge, then push down on the opposite end of the connector. Once done, you'll have to boot up Windows, then install the relevant drivers. This process is easy with Intel, and a bit of a faff with MediaTek, let's take a look at our gains. Here it is with the original module. Here's the Intel AX200. Double speed, less signal strength, and no idea why it's using the 2.4 GHz band. And here's MediaTek's RZ616. Much faster, with less signal strength. Another improvement you could do is to change your Wi-Fi antenna. This could improve signal strength, 
but if you don't want to open your case and change things inside, maybe a Wi-Fi dongle like this would suit your fancy. Oh, and they're really affordable. In our video reviews, we always mention the version of video port available on the system. You might also wonder why having HDMI 2.0 is a bad thing. Put simply, these version numbers state how much information can be sent out to your monitor or TV. And this determines the limit of both resolution and refresh rate, and in layman's terms, bigger is better. At a resolution of ultra-wide 1440p, DisplayPort 1.4 could render out 144Hz, while HDMI 2.0 could only manage 100. We also need to consider the display, not only of the maximum resolution and refresh rate, but also the standards of DisplayPort. So for this monitor, the best connection would be DisplayPort 1.4, and if you had a faster version of it on your mini PC, it'd work, but it'd be limited to the speed of the monitor's port. Another thing to consider is the video cable. This has the potential to bottleneck performance, and if your cable isn't up to spec, graphical corruption may be apparent. But what if you want to upgrade the GPU? There is a route. Traditionally, you can connect an eGPU to the internal M2 PCIe port, but your best option nowadays is if your mini PC supports Oculink. It is pretty pricey though. You need to get the dock, a power supply, and also the graphics card you want to use. But if you want something a bit more elegant, there are packs like this, the One X GPU, and only one solution that contains everything you need to jump straight into AAA gaming. Is there anything we've left out? Well, probably. If there's something you'd like us to take a look at, please whack it in the comments down below. We really hope you found this video informative, and we'd appreciate it if you hit the big thumbs up. I need to use my pump. If you want to support our work, we have a Patreon and a Discord too if you fancy a pint. This has been Amy Chicken of Team Pandory, and I'll catch you on the next one. Ta-ra! And it vibrates.